the first hour gave me confirmation that what God wants to do today. Before I could preach this, we had to get to a point where we believed. How many believe? God is going to do something here today. Hallelujah. I mentioned this a while ago. Hebrews 11 says, if we come to him, we must first believe that he is. And he's a rewarder, a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I want to preach to you today about who he is. Who he is. If you have your Bibles, 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, I quoted this in the first hour. Simply says, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. How many believe that today, that God is looking for a reason to move in your life? I believe that today. I believe that today. I, I believe that God is looking for a reason to manifest his glory here. Now, I know that you're sitting here and you're trying to figure out what is all the hype about, what is all the emotion about, what is all that about. Well, you might not have seen what I've been through. You don't judge the fact that I'm worshiping by anything more than the fact that I've fought some battles. I've been through some things. And when that song says the enemy didn't triumph, I'm not talking about the enemies in the world. I ain't got any enemies in the world, but I got an enemy in my soul, and he didn't, he didn't triumph, and he's not going to triumph. And so when I'm jumping and I'm worshiping and I'm lifting my voice in praise and worship, it's because I've been through some things, and I literally stuck the, the head of Satan under my heel, and I stood there because by the help and mercy of God, we are standing here today. I am thankful for the fact that I feel the presence of God here today, and you should too. You absolutely should too. I believe God, though, desires to move here today. I give honor to your pastor, uh, to your pastor's family. Uh, I do not want to preach before I, I take just a second and just tell you that you are a very, very, very blessed church. Very blessed church. Um, 19 years is an incredible amount of time. Uh, Barna Research Group did a study a few years ago, and the average tenure of a pastor is less than five years in the United States. Less than five years that a man goes somewhere and stays and pastors a church. Less than five years. But they say the most influential pastors, the ones that have the, the greatest impact on their community, the greatest impact on the lives of their congregation, are those men that stay 10 years or less. Over five, but less than 10. Those are the most influential men. Well, your pastor's already doubled that. There's going to be eternal rewards in you because of a family that came here and they fought hell to have church. And you are the beneficiary of that. You ought to thank God every single day for your man of God. You ought to pray for him and hold him up and lift him up. The Bible says that there's going to come a day that he's going to give an account to God for you, whether with joy or with grief. So make sure you're a good saint. That way he don't have to say anything bad about you to God. Well, they came occasionally. They really... Never mind. Let's preach today. Let's preach today. I'm not here to meddle. Hallelujah. How many of you want to see the Lord move today? I do too. I, I want to unburden my heart. I want to give you a simple truth today, but I believe it's the bedrock truth of your Bible. It is the bedrock truth of your Bible. Everything in Scripture points to what I'm going to talk to today. Um, if you are here today and this is new to you, um, you're welcome. I can tell you, though, I know your pastor well enough to know this is not going to be new to you. This is not going to be new to you. But I believe that the Lord wants to work in our generation. But before the world, before the Lord works in this generation, there has to be a revelation that comes to this generation. There has to be a revelation that comes where the blinded eyes are opened. Not the blind, physical blinded eyes, but the spiritual blinded eyes of our world are opened. And the only way that happens is if we preach, we preach the revelation of the mighty God in Christ. The revelation that there is only one God and that his name is Jesus. One God and his name is Jesus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach the one God message today. I didn't come prep to preach this today, but I feel it in the Holy Ghost very, very strongly today. I'm probably going to kick against the spirits today. I'm going to tell you that right now. And I'm okay. I don't, I don't mind quiet buildings. I don't mind, I don't mind any of that. We're going to have a move of God today. We're going to have a move of God today. And it comes by revelation. It comes by revelation. The book of Matthew chapter 16 Verses 13 through 19, not my text, but I do want to read it. When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, 
he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said unto him, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, or some say you're Elias, others say you're Jeremiah, or perhaps one of the prophets. But Jesus looked at them and said, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered him and said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, blessed art thou Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And Peter, I'm going to give to you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. In what we just read in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus asks his disciples a very pointed question. He says, what are the opinions of the world about me? Those people that don't follow me daily, those people that are just out and about, going about their lives, what do, who do they say that I am? It's very important to Jesus. He wants to know what the world says about him. You can go to Google and you can say, who was Jesus? And you'll get a thousand different answers about who Jesus was. We do not live in a world who knows him. We live in a world that knows about him, but they do not know him. We live in a world that will tell you about his mercy. They'll tell you about his grace. They'll tell you about his love, but they do not know who he is. Then Jesus says, okay, I get that the world may have some mixed up ideas about who I am. But You're my disciples. Who do you say that I am? I get that the world may say that I'm John the Baptist, or they might say that I'm Elias, or they might say that I'm another prophet. The world's got a lot of mixed up ideas. They say I'm second in a trinity. They say that I'm an imposter taking the attention away from God. The world's got a lot of mixed up ideas. I get that. But who does the church say that I am? Because the church is a representation of me. And if the church is going to do anything in this generation, they must first know who I am. If the church doesn't know who I am, I can't expect the world to ever know who I am. If the church doesn't know that when they pray in the name Jesus, that they're calling on the Almighty God, then there is no power in the church, and there's no power that's going to be given unto the world. We must first know who he is. And that's what he was saying. You're a follower of me. You've seen me work. You've seen me perform miracles. You've felt my power and my spirit move. I get that the world's got some messed up ideas. I claim, I get that the world professed to know about me and they don't know who I am, but you're the church. You're my closest followers. You better know who I am. He wanted to know, who do they say that I am? Who am I? For you and I to come here today and for you and I to lift our voices in worship like we did, We must know who we worship. Our dance means absolutely nothing today if we do not know why we dance and to who we dance for. Our shout means absolutely nothing today if we do not have a clear and very distinct understanding of the name Jesus. Our worship songs lose absolute power and absolute meaning. They mean absolutely nothing if we do not know to who we sing. I believe this generation has an incredible power on it. I believe this is the the generation that the ends of the world have come. This is the generation that the Bible talks about, that a greater revival than any that we have ever seen is going to sweep through this generation. But it's only going to come if this generation gets revelation of the mighty God in Christ. we got to get revelation of who we worship. We have the potential, I believe, to walk in the greatest anointing that has ever come upon this generation. A generation like Mark would talk about when he would say, Greater things than these shalt thou do. They'll lay hands on the sick that they might recover. They'll take, in thy hands, they'll take up serpents. They'll speak with other tongues. They'll do all, that's come upon this generation. I believe that we will see it. But Hosea, the prophet Hosea, would, would issue a warning. He would issue a warning to the church. Hosea in chapter 4 would prophesy the words of the Lord like this. He would say, hear the word of the Lord. That's pretty important. Anytime you read in scripture, hear the word of the Lord. He's saying, hey, listen to what is about to be said because the Lord wants to say something to you. And if the Lord wants to say something, we need to take heed and listen to that word. Here's what Hosea said. He said, hear hear the word of the Lord. The Lord has controversy with you. 
That's pretty strong language. If there's anybody in our world that I, is going to have controversy with me or want to be angry at me or fight me, I don't want it to be God because I don't stand a chance. Neither do you. He spoke all this stuff into existence. All he's got to do is think me being gone and poof, I'm out. So I don't want the Lord to have controversy with me. But Hosea prophesied, and he said, okay, the people of God, the Lord has controversy with you. Why does the Lord have controversy with you? Well, because there is no truth, and there is no mercy, and there is no knowledge of God in the land. There is a problem that God has when his people do not know who he is. He wants us to know who he is. And then he would say, my people are destroyed. For lack of knowledge. That's pretty stark warning too. They're destroyed for lack of knowledge. Why are they destroyed? Because they have rejected knowledge. And because they rejected knowledge, I will reject them. I don't want to be rejected by God because I don't know who he is. I don't believe anybody here wants that. So we're going we're gonna to talk today. If we're not very careful in our generation, if we're not care- very careful today, We'll start thinking that the power that comes in our church services is only because we worship God. We'll start thinking that our songs are the reason that God is moving. I have to tell you today, it's not the music that we play that makes God move. It's not our shouting. It's not our preaching. It's not our dancing. What makes the heart of God stand at attention is when we join the spirit of our worship to the truth of who we worship. I know I'm going to give you meat today. How many of you like steak? I'm going to give you flat spiritual steak today, okay? No milk today. Okay, y'all ready for steak? I know we got all kinds of barbecue, and you're waiting on me to get out of the way so you can physically eat, but I want to spiritually feed you first because I believe God has something incredibly powerful for this church, and God wants to take you somewhere, but you've got to get revelation first, okay? Here we go. What makes the heart of God stand out of attention more than anything else? is when we couple together the spirit of our worship to the revelation of who we worship. When we combine the truth of who he is and we respond in worship, we step out of the ability of mankind into the supernatural of the spirit of God. Revelation brings power. And so if we want the power of God to move, if we want to have the power of God in our church services, we must first have revelation. To illustrate this, this is not me just talking, I want to illustrate this. Matthew chapter 16, we go back, where Peter makes a very well-known declaration. Simon Peter answered him. Jesus just asked him, okay, the world doesn't know who I am. Who do you say that I am? Peter gives this answer. Peter says, thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him and said, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto me, but my Father which is in heaven. Pretty good. The revelation of Peter is the foundation of the church. According to Jesus, what Peter said as a response to his question came by revelation of the Father. Verse 18 says, I say unto you, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I get this. We're not going to shout today. I'm not trying to get you to shout. I want to give you clear, biblical revelation. Okay? Will you stay with me for 20 minutes today while I just unburden my heart? We're going to get somewhere in the spirit today. Will you just raise your hand if you will just stay with me for 20 minutes? All right. I'm going to give you some meat. Here we go. The church is not built upon Peter. Jesus did not say, upon Peter, I will build my church. He said, upon thee, meaning upon what you have said, upon this rock of what you have said, upon the foundation of what you said, upon this revelation, I will build my church. It's important that we get this because there are too many men and too many people that believe that they are responsible for building the church. Too many people think that it's the talent or their ability that is building the kingdom of God. The church is not built on Peter. The church is not built on man's ability. It is not built on man's talent. The church is built on the revelation of who Jesus is. The church is built by revelation 
of the mighty God in Christ. Consider what Paul would write to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6, without controversy. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. God was justified in the spirit. He was seen of angels. He was preached unto the Gentiles. He was believed on in the world, and he was received up in the glory. We skip over that very first sentence there, without controversy. Those two words actually come from one Greek word. That Greek word simply means by the consent of everyone, meaning everyone believes this. To those that they were writing that day, there was no disagreement here. There was no controversy here. Without controversy. There was no controversy. Everybody agreed on this point. So you could read that scripture like this. Everyone believes that God was justified in the flesh. Meaning the very foundation of what everybody believes is that God was manifest in the flesh. The only church with which God, or the, the, the only church with which hell cannot prevail against is a church that is built on the revelation that God was manifest in the flesh. If you don't hear anything else today, I'm going I'm to walk through a ton of scripture, but hear this. I believe that God is asking this generation to once again get a fresh revelation of who he is. Because I believe that our churches are limited only by the depth of our revelation. That's it. Because if we can get a fresh revelation of who he is, every time we pray for the sick in the name of Jesus, we'll know with the authority and the power of the word of God and the authority and the power of that name that we are invoking the almighty God. When we pray and when we speak in faith, when we pray in faith, when we operate in faith, blinded eyes will respond. Dead men will be raised. With withered hands will be healed. Why? Because Jesus himself said, greater things than these shalt thou do. If we're not doing greater than what we see in Scripture, we're not fulfilling Scripture. If we're not seeing the implications of faith revealed to us, we're not obeying Scripture. I believe there are four things that we have to nail down today. Four things. Before God releases to us what he wants to do, I believe it, God has to reveal to him or to reveal to us himself. Before we get there, we're going to simply ask, answer the question, who is he? Who is he? If you take notes, you can take notes on this. I taught this in my church. I'm going to try to preach it today, but I'm going to, I'm going to just, if you take notes, you can take notes. If not, then, then, then listen up real carefully. Number one principle that we have to get down before we go anywhere else today, is that there is only one God. There is only one God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, and verse 5 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is... We love that verse. We're apostolic. We love that verse. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord. Love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. To the Jewish people that day, this was the most important word that they had ever been given from God. Because it was given to them at a time where they were about to cross over into the promised land. And God simply wanted them to tell them, Moses, tell my people that before you go into the promised land, you need to know who I am. Because when they get there, they're going to be in a strange world, in a strange land with strange gods. And I don't want my people getting confused about my identity. So listen up, Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love him and him only with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Jesus himself identified this as the greatest principle. He said in Mark chapter 12, verse 28, that when the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together, he perceived that he had answered them well. He, they asked him, what is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered, the first of all commandments is this, do unto others as you should have them do unto you. It's not the first commandment. It's not the greatest commandment. Jesus said the greatest commandment is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. It should be said that the great commandment of Scripture is both the knowledge of God's oneness and the requirement of loving him wholeheartedly. 
It does absolutely no good to simply know that there is one God if you do not love him with all of your heart. And it does no good at all if you love just any God. It does no good at all if you just fall in love with a God. It must be the God, the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jehovah, Yahweh, revealed to us there is only one God, and we should love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So whatever we believe about God, whatever we believe about God, it must be built on the very first principle that God is one. He is not three in one. He is one. Romans chapter 30, verse 30 says, Seeing it is one God which shall justify us by faith. Ephesians 4, 6, 4, 6 says that there is one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. Meaning that there is one God that when we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost is in us. In us. Principle number one. There is only one God. Number two. One, that one God of the scripture. That one God of Scripture, I know this is super powerful. You ready? He's simply a spirit. <laughs> Nothing hard about that. John 4, 24 says, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. If anyone could identify who God was, it would, be, would have been Jesus. Jesus never said God is three persons. He never said God is a person. Jesus said God is a spirit. Therefore, the biblical identification of God is not that he is three persons, not that he is two persons, not that he is three persons, and they're all co-inhabitating together, revealed in three different people. God is not even a person. Jesus said God is a spirit. Therefore, the biblical identification of God is that God is a spirit. Furthermore, the spirit we call God was identified to us by Jesus. As being the Father. In John 4, 23 and 24. But the hour cometh and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. It's obvious in verse 23. When Jesus spoke of God, he was speaking of the Father. Therefore, you could read verse 24 like this. The Father is a spirit. The Father cannot be the first person of a Godhead. He's not a person at all. He is a spirit. Everybody say, He is a spirit. So regardless of how our world wants to define God as a person, the fact remains that God is not a person. God is a spirit. Simple. Simple. Number three, the Son of God is that which was born of Mary. That may not make sense here, but I want to read a verse to you. In Luke chapter 1, verse 35. The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also the holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. First of all, we have to take just a second. Do we have? We don't. Luke chapter 1, verse 35. Angel answered and said to her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. Everybody see that sentence? The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. Okay. It was the Holy Ghost that performed the miracle of paternity upon Mary. And so by simple logic, it is evident that the Father of Jesus was the Holy Ghost. If that's the case, we are left with only a couple options here. Either Jesus had more than one father. Jesus might have been confused about who his father was. Or the father and the Holy Ghost are the same. Meaning there's no distinction. There's no separation. The father and the Holy Ghost are the same. The only logical conclusion then must be found in Scripture. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 4 says, there is only one spirit. God is a spirit. The Father is a spirit. But Ephesians says there's only one spirit. 
And since the Father is a spirit and the Holy Ghost is a spirit, but there's only one spirit, then there is no distinction between Father and Holy Ghost. They are the one spirit. God is a spirit. But Jesus was born of woman. Jesus was flesh and blood. And so number four, and we're going to get somewhere. In a world that wants to identify Jesus as a lesser God, they want to identify him as second in the Trinity. They want to put distinction upon him. That there is Father and there is Son and there is, there is Holy Ghost. And they're all three are one, but they, they're, not, they're co-equal, but they're not the same as each other. That makes zero biblical sense. There is one spirit. God and the Father are spirit. There's no distinction there. There's no different persons there because they're a spirit. They're not people. They're a spirit. Because God is not a person. Because God is a spirit. We draw the last little bit of this from Scripture today. And I believe that when we do and when we have revelation, I believe that when we, when we have church today and we have church from this moment forward, you're going to worship and you're going to understand who you worship fully. You're going to pray in the name of Jesus and understand that when you pray, you are calling on the mighty God in Christ, revealed to us in Christ. When you say the name Jesus, you're going to have full understanding and knowledge that that name brings an infinite amount of power and authority with it. It's not just a name. It's not just a name. God is a spirit. He is not a person in a Godhead. He is a spirit. And God, that spirit, was in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 says, To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now remember that when we read in Scripture, we read, the terms of God, or we read the Father, we instantly have to equate that with spirit. When we read the, ser the terms Christ, or we read the Son, we instantly have to think flesh. Therefore, when scriptures could be read like this, to wit that the Spirit was in the flesh, reconciling the world unto, anybody can finish that? themselves reconciling the world unto himself the spirit was in the flesh reconciling all of us unto himself the spirit was in flesh notice it's not themselves which gives us proof that the father indwelt the son making one individual Jesus, when we see him, was both God and man. John chapter 8 says that he was a man. John chapter 20, Thomas said that he was God. Even though he wasn't 50 years old yet in John chapter 8, it said he existed before Abraham. In Luke chapter 2, it said that he grew in wisdom. But yet in John 21, Peter said Jesus knows all things. He's described in 2 Corinthians as being weak. In John 4, he was weary. But in Revelation 8, Jesus is called the Almighty. I, I could preach this for a, a hundred. I want to slow down. I want to teach just for a moment. He was on earth, but John 3 says he was also in heaven. In Luke 22, we find him praying. We find Jesus praying. But yet in John 14, it was Jesus who was described as answering our prayers. These scriptures do not point to multiple persons, but rather that there is one God revealed in the flesh. As both God and man, at any point in time in his life, he could speak from either the perspective of God or the perspective of man. He could act and speak as God, and he could act and speak as as man, maybe you need proof. You ready? When he said, my spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak, he spoke as man. But when he said, all power is given unto me, he spoke as God. 
when he got weary in his body and he got on a boat and rode a boat across the, the Sea of Gadara, he acted as man. But when he walked on water to get Peter out of the boat, he acted as God. When he said, my spirit or my flesh thirst, he spoke as man. But when he saw the woman at the well, he said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me, for I am... He acted as God. When he said, I need help in the garden, he acted as man. But when he miraculously healed others, he acted as God. Jesus is not John the Baptist come again. He is not a second incarnate of Jeremiah. He is not Isaiah 2.0. He is God revealed to us in man. Maybe there's confusion there. Because our world says that Jesus is just a second in a Godhead. But the Bible says, Paul said, that Jesus is not in the Godhead. Because there is not a Godhead that he lives in. The Godhead is in him. Paul said, in him, the fullness of the Godhead dwells. God was made flesh and revealed to us. He's not second in the Godhead. The Godhead is not in, or he's not in the Godhead. It's in him. He is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In him, the fullness of the Godhead dwells. Jesus is the son of God, but he's also the father of all things. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. If you have a problem with any of this today, your problem's not with me. You might think it is today, but it's not. The problem you have today is answering Isaiah's declaration in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, when speaking about the birth of the Son of God, or speaking about the birth of Jesus. For the, unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, The mighty God. But what else? The everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. This verse calls him both the Son and the Father. How could he be both Father and Son? In the same way that he can be both Alpha and Omega. Beginning and the end. The first and the last, the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. He's both the root of David and the offspring of David. Uh, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah, but he's also the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. Uh, he's the sacrifice, uh, but he's also the altar. Uh, he's the king of kings, uh, the lord of lords, uh, and the redeemer. He's our judge. Uh, in him, humanity and deity came together. They were fused, uh, but there was no confusion. Uh, when you say the name Jesus, uh, that is the name given among us whereby we must be saved that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow every tongue shall confess things in heaven things in earth and things under earth. in him humanity and deity came together when he assumed a human nature at his birth he never stopped being God I know there's confusion about well, Stephen, when he was being stoned, he looked up and he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God. I have a really cool illustration. You ready? Come here, Axton. God is a spirit, right? Do you see a spirit? Okay, I need you to go stand on the right hand of God. Go stand on the right hand of a spirit. can't do it because a spirit has no right in hand the bible defines him as an omnipresent god meaning he is everywhere at all times meaning the same presence of god that we feel in this building is the same spirit of god that they're feeling in africa it's the same spirit of god they're feeling in antarctica it's the same spirit that if you go to mars right now and you begin to pray it's the same spirit that will be there there is no right hand to a spirit so when stephen said i see jesus standing at the right hand of god it wasn't a physical person that jesus was standing at the right hand of the right hand was a signal of authority and power and what stephen said is that when i see jesus i see the authority and the power of all my 
Almighty God. He's who I've been preaching about. He's who I've been believing in. And when I get there, I'm going to see him. Well, what about when Jesus prayed in the garden? He prayed to his father. He was both God and man. Flesh prayed to spirit. Well, what about in Revelation? When you get to Revelation. Well, actually, well, let's get to the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus ascended back into heaven. In that moment that Jesus ascended back into heaven after his death, you never, you never find God speak outside the voice of Jesus again. Because it was a fulfillment of what Jesus said in that there would be a day when he would become the all in all. And so in Revelation, uh, when you read Scripture, if you've got a red-letter Bible, in your, if you've got a red-letter edition of your Bible, open it up. Uh, it's not God speaking in Revelation. Uh, it's Jesus speaking in Revelation. Uh, it's not three people. Uh, it's one throne. Uh, and we will stand for eternity uh, and worship around the one throne. Uh, we'll say the name. Uh, we'll preach in the name. Uh, we'll baptize in the name. Why? Because it is God revealed to us. There's one God. And there's one name given among men whereby we must be saved. So when he said in Matthew, go, there, go ye therefore to all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. There's all sorts of confusion about that. I get it. Because our world wants to confuse the identity of Jesus. And the reason they want to confuse the identity of Jesus is because the devil knows that inside of us, Ecclesiastes 3 says that there is a piece of eternity that is locked inside of us. There is a spot in our heart that God has reserved for him and him only. There will always be a call in the hearts of mankind to know who created us. We try to fill that with drugs. We try to fill that with alcohol. We try to fill that with a lot of different areas. It's never going to be satisfying. And the reason it's not satisfying is because it is not God. We might make it a God. But it is not God. And the reason the enemy wants to confuse Jesus to the world is because he wants to get every single one of us so mixed up about the identity of God. He knows he can't keep you out of church. He knows he can't keep you from having a longing to know your creator. But if he can confuse you about who he is, he can keep you still on the wrong path, heading the wrong direction. We must have revelation of who we serve so that one day when we look up and we see that throne in glory, we know to who sits on that throne. So I believe today, stand with me. Where's our musicians? Come very quickly. I believe that God is looking for a generation that will couple together what they know about God, all the love and all the mercy and all the grace that we know about God. We'll join that to the revelation of who he really is. I was praying the other day, and God told me, I was like, God, we need revelation this generation, God. In the course of that prayer, God revealed something to me that blew my mind, and I just want to share it with you today. We do not need another revelation about the mercy of God. We do not need a deeper revelation about the grace of God. We do not need another revelation about how, how much God loves us. We need a revelation of who God is. Because if we ever get a true revelation of who he is, We'll never question again the depth that his mercy will go to get us. We'll never question again how good his grace can be in our life. We'll never question whether or not he loves us. But we have to know who he is. So here's what's going to happen this morning. I know that you, it feels quiet. We're not running around and dancing and jumping. I get that. But we're fixing to step into something. I believe that with everything inside of me. I'm not, just, I'm not just trying to hype you up. I'm telling you, God wants to move in this place today. If you've never received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you must first believe that he is. When they came to, in Acts 16, they came to them and said, have you ever received the baptism of the Holy Ghost? They said, well, we've never heard about it. He said, well, have, have you received since you believed? Meaning that before you can even receive the Holy Ghost, you must first believe first. I'm simply trying to give you the right thing to believe in. 
That's it. I believe God wants to fill somebody with the Holy Ghost today for the very first time. And not only that, I believe for somebody else that's maybe been struggling with the identity of God, just trying to give you foundation so that when you go home and you go home to those same familiar spirits in your home, those drugs and the alcohol and the pornography, and you go home to all of that stuff that you've been battling, you've been praying for, and you've been, you've been fighting against, you're going to walk into your home with authority this time because you know that when you say the name Jesus, it's not just a name you're saying. You're calling on God made flesh and revealed to us. Jesus is the image, the image of the invisible God. That's not my words. That's Paul's words. Here's what we're going to do today. The Bible says that his eyes look to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong. But if you don't know who you're looking for, you'll miss what God's trying to do. I'm so tired of living in a generation in a world that says, well, if I pray to Jesus, he'll take my prayers up to Jehovah. Jehovah will bring my my prayers back to Jesus. And then it's this convoluted mess. And then you get into the, you know, maybe, maybe if I pray to Mary, she's the mother of God. Mary's not the mother of God. God existed long before Mary was. She was the mother of the Son of God. She was born, he was born of woman, the flesh. She was not the mother of God. So when he said to honor her, he was simply saying honor her because of her faith. She had a lot of faith. He wasn't saying that we need to pray for her, pray to her for all eternity because she can answer your prayers. At the day of Pentecost, you want to know who one of the first people that were in that upper room that day? Mary. The same spirit that filled them on the day of Pentecost was the same spirit that Mary had to be filled with. Just because she gave birth to Jesus didn't mean she was saved. Just because she had a knowledge of who he was did not mean that she, didn't, she could skip the upper room that day. She couldn't skip it. She had to be there just like you and I have to be there. We have to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the evidence of speaking in tongues, the same way she did and the same way the other 120 did that day. Here's what's going to happen this morning. If you would, join me right here on the front. I'm accustomed to quiet, I promise. I'm, I'm, I'm well in my comfort zone right now. Well in my comfort zone. I pastor a small church. Sometimes it's like i got to put like electrical outlets or something underneath the seats just to kind of like shock them. I'm good. Y'all have responded better than I'm accustomed to, so we're in good shape today. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to ask you a couple questions, all right? How many gods are there? One God. What is the name given to us? Jesus. When we say the name Jesus, we have authority. We have authority. Because that name brings authority with it. That's why every time Jesus showed up somewhere, every spirit became submissive to him. Okay, here's what we're going to do. You know who he is. And you know the name, which means right now when we begin to pray, I've already feel, I already feel the presence of God in this place right now sweeping through here. I need you to understand something. He is stronger than your depression. He is stronger than whatever ounce of anxiety that you're dealing with. He is stronger than whatever broken heart you came in here with. He is stronger than any disease in your body. He is stronger than any bit of misery that you're living in. He's stronger. He's bigger. He's the creator of all things. David said 83 times in Scripture, David said this. David called God my strength. He changed in Scripture when he was praying. And I think it's just David's own way of doing it. He said, he's my strength. That's what he labeled God as. It's simply my strength. What David was saying is that every time I've been weak, he's been my strength. Every time that I am broken, He's been my strength. Every time I'm in need, he's been my strength. He's my strength and my song, an ever-present help in times of trouble. So here's what we're going to do right now. Every head bowed, every eye closed.